and I am the Regional Chief of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction in Asia Pacific, based in Bangkok. I will be moderating today's webinar. And before we start, I would like to note that all webinar attendees are muted by default. If you have a question that you would like to ask, please submit it through the questions and answer feature, not the chat box. And after the presentations, I will direct some of these questions to the panelists. It is not an overstatement to say that we are in the middle of an extraordinary time. Much of the world is unified in combating a deadly new pathogen. World economies are in downward spirals and social cohesion is threatened. Many are concerned about what comes next. In times of crisis, people look to their leaders for guidance and help. For many countries, these leaders are the elected representatives in parliament. They carry the aspirations of their people and are responsible for shaping the laws, budgets, and governance mechanisms that protect and serve all citizens. Months into this global disaster, it is clear that far greater attention to risk reduction, including those caused by biological hazards, could have helped prevent the tremendous loss of life and devastating socioeconomic consequences of this pandemic. Nonetheless, there is still much that can be done to further limit the spread of the virus and reduce the impact of the pandemic, especially on those most vulnerable. The goal of today's webinar is to provide parliamentarians from around the world with the latest information and recommendations on how to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And to that end, we are thankful to the esteemed leaders of the World Health Organization, the Interparliamentary Union, and the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction for taking the time to speak on this issue today. Without further ado, I am very honored to welcome Dr. Tedros Adam Gebreyehus, the Director General of the World Health Organization. Dr. Tedros, in the midst of this crisis, what are your key messages to parliamentarians? How can they support the efforts of countries and facilitate implementation of the emergency health measures recommended by WHO? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, Ms. Mami, Ms. Turi, and uh, my friend, uh, Martin, the Secretary General, dear colleagues and friends. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for the opportunity of speaking to you today. You're all aware of the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is having on societies and economies. We're facing an unprecedented global health crisis that demands an unprecedented respond, agreeing with what uh, my sister initially said at the opening. From the beginning of this pandemic, I have stressed the need for an all of government approach. And I have also stressed the need for global solidarity built on the foundation of national unity. As a former parliamentarian myself, I know the critical role parliaments can play in enhancing resilience against health emergencies like COVID-19. Parliaments can establish legislative, legislative measures to govern, enable, and support risk management measures. They can ensure public health systems, other sectors, and research institutes are adequately funded. They can build accountability through oversight of government emergency management policies and programs. And they can ensure a multi-sectoral approach for all hazardous disaster risk management in countries. The pandemic has also highlighted the importance of implementing the international health regulations and the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. But it also highlights the importance of accelerating universal health coverage and driving progress towards the sustainable development goals. These are all areas in which parliaments can make a difference. I welcome this initiative between WHO, UNDRR, and the IPU 
to host this webinar and to share experiences and best practices in preparing for and responding to COVID-19. I would like to thank Ms. Mami, Ms. Turi, and the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction for your collaboration with WHO to support countries in strengthening emergency preparedness. With the support of UNDR, UNDRR, who has published a comprehensive health emergency and disaster risk management framework to support all countries to reduce and manage public health emergency risks, including disease outbreaks. I would also like to thank the Interparliamentary Union and Ms. Martin, uh, my, my friend, for bringing us together to support parliamentary action to reduce risks, strengthen emergency preparedness, and increase resilience. WHO has a long-standing collaboration with the IPU. In 2018, we signed a, MOU, a memorandum of understanding which identifies global health security as one of the three priority areas, together with universal health coverage and promoting health. Last year, I was delighted to attend the IPU assembly in Belgrade, Serbia, where the assembly adopted the first ever resolution on universal health coverage. As a follow-up to this webinar, we will work with, you, with IPU on the development of concrete asks for parliamentarians to synthesize lessons learned today and to give parliamentarians a practical tool for advocacy, legislation, budget allocation, and accountability to address the COVID-19 pandemic. WHO is also working with IPU on the development of a handbook on the role of parliaments in strengthening health security, which will be launched in the coming months. Thank you all once again for your participation in today's webinar and for your support and commitment to a healthier, safer, fairer world. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, for elaborating on how WHO will be collaborating with IPU and parliamentarians in the fight against this pandemic. I would now like to move to Mr. Martin Chungong, the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union. Mr. Chungong, how is the IPU supporting the centrality of parliaments in addressing COVID-19? And how can parliamentary exchanges and actions contribute to the response in the pandemic? Thanks. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank yes. you, Loretta. Um, I am pleased to join my colleagues, uh, Director General Tedros and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Tumi uh, in welcoming all of you, all the parliamentarians out there to this very important uh, webinar, the first uh, in a series that we intend to do for parliamentary uh, members and, and staff. And uh, this, as you know, will focus on uh, COVID-19. I am very uh, proud to be able to partner with WHO and uh, uh, UNDRR in putting together this tool for parliamentarians. Indeed, slowing down and stopping the spread of COVID-19 requires measures that have a profound impact on the lives of citizens, the economy and society as a whole. These measures require more and not less parliamentary scrutiny. In times of crisis, parliaments are duty bound to ensure that all measures taken result in enhanced protection and support of all, especially the most vulnerable. Ensuring inclusive decision-making processes and mainstreaming gender equality and human rights in all legislative and budgetary processes are key. Parliaments must therefore be at the heart of the national and global response to COVID-19. And the Interparliamentary Union is very pleased to be part of that global effort to mobilize parliaments. Indeed, 
as solidarity and cooperation have never been so important, we are doing our best to mobilize parliaments, supporting them in the exercise of their democratic mandate, even in a period of deep crisis as the one we are witnessing today. And we are doing our best in facilitating access to examples of good parliamentary practices. We have launched a campaign, Parliaments in Time of a Pandemic, and this campaign is mobilizing parliaments in the global response to COVID-19 and drawing lessons for future parliamentary response. As you may know, democracy is too often couched in or conceived of as very abstract. And there's not always a clear perceived link between the values and principles they embody, it embodies. The current crisis, COVID-19, is an opportunity for us to bring parliaments to the forefront, to bring parliament from theory to practice. In other words, taking parliament from the classroom to the field and asking parliaments to implement those powers that they have to good effect. And in this case, protecting human populations from the current uh, virus. And I can say proudly that there is compelling evidence out there that parliaments are actually stepping up to the plate. And I'm pleased to welcome at this webinar an illustrious member of the IPU, uh, Petra Bayer, who will be talking to you about what parliaments are doing to uh, help the global effort. We are working, and as uh, Dr. Tedro said, we're working with our partners, and we're pleased to strengthen our partnership with UNDRR to keep and step up parliamentary action on disaster risk reduction. And our longstanding cooperation with WHO now fully integrates global health security. We will be learning from COVID-19 to provide parliaments with the knowledge and technical support necessary to strengthen emergency preparedness and response. A new handbook, as he has just said, will provide practical guidance to parliaments with, uh, that will help them to respond to crisis in the future. Now, we can say that there is a compelling case out there for the scientific community and parliaments that represent the policy community to come together in a common endeavor. And in this way, I'm saying that going back to business as usual cannot be an option. It is imperative that we move from the fight, firefighting mode in which we are today to a proactive prevention mode, a mode that pre, uh, promotes resilience. And we have to do so very speedily. Parliaments must contribute to efforts that ensure our health systems are well resourced and resilient in the face of future emergencies, that international frameworks to enhance preparedness and reduce the vulnerabilities of communities are fully implemented at the national level. We see the current pandemic crisis as an opportunity to learn and to ensure that parliaments come out stronger and more responsive to the needs of the citizens they represent and should serve. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to our deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chungong, especially for highlighting the importance of parliamentary scrutiny and the role that parliaments play in helping to protect the most vulnerable and to also strengthen health systems. It's my pleasure to now introduce Ms. Mami Mitsutori, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction. Ms. Mitsutori, from a disaster risk reduction perspective, what national efforts need to be strengthened now to better prevent and prepare for disasters, including pandemics? And what is the role of parliamentarians in supporting these efforts? Thank you, Lori. Dr. Tedros, Mr. Chungong, Honorable parliamentarians, colleagues, and friends, COVID-19 is a global health crisis 
it is a socioeconomic crisis and also a disaster management crisis. Five years ago, while memories were still fresh of earlier outbreaks of Ebola, SARS, MERS, and H1N1, governments and parliamentarians of member states pushed very hardly for the inclusion of biological hazards in the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. The Sendai Framework did create the opportunity for integrating public health management and disaster risk management. But sadly, COVID-19 has revealed that efforts to prepare for and prevent a disaster of this magnitude was not adequate at all. Now faced with the urgent need to respond to COVID-19, examples of, co of corporations are emerging. The National Disaster Management Authority in India is taking on the task of low level treatment needs to reduce pressure on the health system. In Bangladesh, preparing for the cyclone season, authorities are looking into managing large scale evacuations so that cyclone shelters do not become locations of infection. This is encouraging, but we can do much better. In order to go beyond responding and recovering better from this pandemic and to prepare and prevent for the possible next one, our disaster risk management approach needs to be strategically strengthened. And how do we do this? In line with one of the targets of the Sendai framework, currently 81 UN member states have developed national strategies for disaster risk reduction, but not many have included biological hazards such as COVID-19. This is why the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction is rapidly developing new guidance and tools to ensure that national strategies do address pandemic preparedness. We will work with WHO to facilitate their implementation. Furthermore, in order to tackle the systemic nature of contemporary risk in an interconnected global society, action must also be systemic and holistic. This means that beyond responding to the health risks, all risk drivers must be tackled together. We are talking about the public health service and infrastructure, urban planning, food insecurity, climate emergency, safeguarding biodiversity, poverty, inequality, among others. And this is where the role of parliamentarians comes in. You are the ones who can strengthen the governance of disaster risk management by establishing rules and regulations. You can advocate for enacting your national strategy for disaster risk reduction into legislation so that they receive political attention, financial resources, and administrative structures for implementation. Parliamentarians can also advocate for the implementation of these strategies at the local level where most of the work for response, recovery, and prevention occur. Effective disaster management is about leadership and your constituents need strong leadership now. We hope to work with the Interparliamentary Union in supporting your work of parliamentarians around the world towards this goal. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Mitsutori, for pointing out how important it is that the health sector work closely with national disaster management authorities and also the importance of including biological hazards into disaster risk reduction strategies, both at the national and local level. Well, I would like to thank all three leaders for sharing their views and recommendations so far on this webinar. It is now time to hear more from WHO specifically on the current status of the global pandemic. And we will be hearing from two experts. The first is Dr. Mike Ryan. He's the executive director of the WHO Health Emergencies Program. And he also chairs the UN Crisis Management Team, which coordinates UN support to countries in managing the pandemic. Dr. Ryan will in turn hand off to Dr. Maria van Kerkhoff, an epidemiologist and the WHO's COVID-19 technical lead. So over to Dr. Ryan, please. 
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. And uh, I will try and keep my remarks short, as my colleague Maria will give you the, the technical briefing and give you more detail on the current status of the pandemic. So my remarks will be more uh, uh, just as a chapeau. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Martin, uh, for your leadership in, in pulling this uh, together. Um, I'm very often, before this pandemic ever started, uh, um, I, I often do lectures uh, for masters of public health students and other people in training. And uh, people often ask me, you know, what are the most important things in emergency management? And I usually answer, there are three most important things in large scale emergency management are uh, governance, governance, and governance. And it sometimes surprises students of science and public health the, that the most important element of responding effectively to an emergency is leadership and governance, trust between citizens and the state, a social contract that allows citizens to accept uh, interventions that are not comfortable, very not often not understandable sometimes, uh, and accept that at trust from a government that's acting in their best interest, <clears throat> leading and laying a path behind them. Uh, uh, well, I think Waldo Emerson once said, the best kind of leaders are not those who, who follow a path, but those who make a path and leave a trail behind them. And, and I think we've seen in this response that governments who make that path and leave a clear trail for their communities to follow have been successful. Um, and I think for me, I fundamentally believe in, in that relationship. And this is a moment, and I'd, Dr. Tedros speaks of this all the time, the need for bipartisanship when dealing with emergencies. You need to leave your party affiliations at the door, your ideology at the door, and the DG often tells us, leave your ego at the door. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, for me, that is one of the hallmarks of, of this pandemic response. This is just not a technical public health response. It's, an all of, it's a response requiring a, a complete societal adaptation to a new reality and political leaders are absolutely essential to the success for that transition now uh, into what are very severe measures and into a further transition as we move into a new normal uh, constantly explaining that to citizens doing that in a bipartisan way setting aside ideologies um, is something quite tough and very very hard to achieve um, on, uh, on our side, I think um, we recognize frontline health workers as been the heroes, and you see everyone speaking about that every day. But we also have to see what accountabilities come with that. Governments have a deep accountability to protect those that they project as heroes. And I think this is somewhere where we need to reflect upon the need to protect our frontline health workers and give them the tools and capacities and resources they need to serve. Uh, they should not have to be so brave. Um, the, uh, um, the other thing I think we're all concerned about are the concurrent disasters during this pandemic, uh, ongoing epidemics and other issues. We've seen the locust swarms in East Africa. We've seen hunger. We see continued flooding events in, in Kenya and in the Pakat area. We see the world hasn't stopped and the disasters haven't stopped. Uh, and it is difficult to continue to do uh, to respond to all of those other disasters, as well as the Director General says, sustain universal health coverage in many countries. So I think uh, we need to recognize that COVID-19 is not the only crisis we face. We face a looming climate crisis. We face so many other issues as well. So when we look to how we manage this crisis, I think we need to see how this crisis can teach us lessons. Uh, about responding to all of those other crises. This is not the first crisis we'll face together, it's certainly not the last. So I think when we look forward in terms of, Martin, you spoke to this, the DG spoke to this, when we speak to preparedness, we need to now commit to the concept of preparedness. Jouad Major is here with us, our ADG. The Director General established a division of preparedness long in advance, one of his first acts as DG recognizing that preparedness for disasters and preparedness for emergencies was equally and probably way more important than just responding to them. And I think this pandemic is also a lesson to us. We must try to never let this happen again. 
and we have huge work ahead of us together with the parliaments to put in place the legislation, the financing, the investment needed to make our societies, our communities more resilient, to make our health systems more resilient, to put in place the early warning systems that are needed going forward. Um, there's, there's only one thing more tragic than a disaster, and that is not to learn from that disaster and allow it to happen again. Um, we all have a responsibility collectively to, to make that happen. And can I assure you all that since the very beginning of this um, epidemic, since our epidemic intelligence systems picked up this event on December 31st, we have worked day and night under the leadership of Dr. Ted Ross. We have put every ounce of our energy and our souls into this fight in the 150 country offices, six regional offices, in headquarters here with our 250 collaborating centres around the world, <clears throat> with our over 250 partners in Gore, with the thousands and thousands of experts around the world who've participated in our expert networks. We have alerted, warned, uh, and sometimes shouted at the world to wake up and understand what was happening. Um, and uh, we need to continue to do that because we're now reaching another phase where a, an element of complacency is beginning to emerge again. And that complacency is, oh, we're finished with lockdown now, we just moved to the new normal and everything is going to be the same as it was before. I'm sorry, that doesn't happen by itself. Uh, and we do have a very careful process to go through to get the world back to something like we would recognize as normal. And that is going to require very careful and informed uh, leadership, scientifically informed leadership in parliaments and in governments to guide our nations and our peoples through what is going to be, I think, a difficult few months as we transition with the constant threat of this disease jumping back and doing further damage to our social, and political um, and economic lives. But again, to reassure you, we have raised the alarm, we have shouted from the rooftops uh, about this event since the very beginning. Uh, and we hope now, as we move into the next phase of this response, that we can move forward together in a more coherent way to, uh, to mitigate the worst impacts of this event. Maria. Thanks, Mike. Um, so thank you for good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, we, I have a few slides that I would like to show, um, if those could be pulled up. Wonderful. So if you can move to the next slide, please. I'm just going to give a very brief overview. I won't go in detail on all of these slides, but we'll make sure that we make these available to you. So this is just a snapshot. Uh, and, and I should first of all say that I'm, I'm presenting this on behalf of a huge team across all of WHO, the three levels of the organization and all of our partners. And this is only a piece of, of, of the situation where we are right now and a little bit of some of the, some of the guidance that's been uh, provided in strategic response has been provided so far. So just to give you a, a snapshot of the beginning, the early stages of this, what you see on this timeline here are in blue are some of the, uh, the information that we were learning about this new novel virus, starting from the cluster of 27 cases of pneumonia of unknown origin, which was reported from Wuhan on the 31st of December. Um, we immediately activated our system uh, on, on the 1st of January, uh, where, we incident, where we initiated our incident management system. Um, and then on the 5th of January was the first time that we reported through our event information system to all member states and contact points about this situation, about what we knew, about what we put in place to protect people. And the first disease outbreak news was issued publicly on the 5th of January. Um, on the 10th and the 11th of January was the first time that we issued our a package of technical guidance, um, which was issued through our emergency directors in all six regions to our country offices as well as posted online for everybody to, to be made available. Um, the first mission that took place from WHO, which was our country office um, and representatives from our Wipro office uh, was on the 20th and the 21st of January. And that group went to the epicenter in Wuhan um, to better understand the situation that was unfolding there. Um, the first emergency committee was on the 22nd and the 23rd of January, followed by a second WHO mission to uh, China 
which included our Director General and Mike Ryan and others. Um, the second emergency committee was on the 30th of January. And just to highlight what Mike has said, the, we declared a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January, which is the highest level of alert that we have under the international health regulations. And that was on the 30th. Um, this was followed by our third mission to, to China, which was the joint WHO China mission, which began in mid February. Next slide, please. If we fast forward to today, I'm sorry about the formatting. Um, if we fast forward to today, um, yeah, globally. When we declared a global emergency, the number of cases. Yes, I will. And the WHO China. Absolutely. Um, when you look at the, the total number of cases that were reported today, globally, we have over 2.8 million cases reported um, and about 200,000 deaths so far. Um, on the left, you'll see the cumulative number of cases. This is a rate per 1 million people. Um, the darker indicates a higher uh, incidence. And on the right-hand side, that, that's the cumulative on the left, and on the right-hand side is in the last day. And so you can see where the hot spots are currently. Next slide, please. This is mortality. Again, on the left is cumulative um, per 1 million people. And on the right is our deaths over the last day. Next slide, please. So if we come back to this timeline, um, this is the global epi curve of the number of confirmed cases reported to WHO to date by region um, from government sources. And what you can see is on the 30th of January on the left hand side there in orange is actually the epi curve from China. Um, and on the day that we reported uh, declared the public health emergency of international concern, there were 82 cases outside of China and no deaths. Um, and what you can see following on the right are, is the epi curve in Europe, which is in this pink salmon color, um, and in the Americas in yellow. And so you can see the juxtaposition in terms of what we were dealing with back in January to where we are today. Next slide, please. So we have published a, a strategy for COVID-19. Um, this was published in February, I believe the first one, and an update was published very recently with our global uh, strategic objectives, which are to mobilize all sectors of communities to ensure that we have an all of government, all of society approach to control transmission so that we, we prevent the movement of sporadic cases to more community transmission and that we suppress transmission to move back down, back down to clusters, back to individual cases and ultimately to control to reduce mortality by providing appropriate clinical care to all of those individuals who are affected by COVID-19 and ensure that essential services remain so that we do not have people die from other diseases other than COVID-19 because of this pandemic and to accelerate the safe, the development of the sa of safe and effective vaccines and therapeutics. Next slide, please. So all of our guidance that's online, we have more than 50 pieces of guidance uh, that are online focusing on supporting countries' preparedness, readiness, and response actions, which helps them as they deal with different levels of transmission within their country. Whether they have no countries, uh, no cases, um, whether they have one or more cases in a sporadic sense, whether they are dealing with clusters of cases, or they have community transmission. And just to highlight that countries can move from limited transmission all the way to community transmission, but they can also move back down again. And we've seen a number of countries that have done this across Asia, now in Europe, where have they, they've had some success at actually reducing and suppressing transmission. Next slide, please. Um, as some countries um, are considering the lifting of some of the public health and social measures that they've put in place, sometimes called lockdown measures, um, we are providing guidance to countries to do this in a safe way. Um, it is very difficult to sit here in Geneva and to have one type of an approach that will work everywhere. So all countries must consider the transmission situation that they're in and the capacity for them to respond. And we highlight seven considerations that they must consider before lifting these measures, which include ensuring that transmission is controlled, ensuring that there's a sufficient public health workforce and health system capacities in place. This means people in place to find the virus, to do contact tracing, to test laboratory samples, to care for patients in healthcare facilities, to quarantine the contacts, um, to ensure that the outbreak risks in high vulnerable settings are minimized. This can include long-term living facilities, 
This can include expat dormitories. This can include vulnerable settings. Um, there are many situations where this virus has the opportunity to take off. Um, make sure that preventative measures are established in workplaces and ensure that when people go back to work, they're put back to work in a controlled way. Um, and that we manage the risk of exportation of cases between countries and even within countries. And most importantly, that communities remain fully engaged. This is not something that can start late. Communities must be fully engaged in power to know what they can do to prevent transmission, um, infection from themselves and transmission to others. And we must ensure that business continuity for non-COVID-19 health services remain. Next slide, please. A very brief slide on therapeutics and vaccines. There's a huge amount of work in this area and we are so grateful to all of our, our partners globally, which are advancing the work on therapeutics and vaccines. We're grateful to the work that started with SARS and MERS where we were able to leverage that to, to pursue and accelerate this work. Uh, WHO has launched the Solidarity Clinical Trial, which is an international clinical trial, a multi-site, multi-hospital. Um, study which is comparing four treatment options. We currently have more than 1,600 patients enrolled from 11 countries and we are ready to enroll patients in another 100 countries globally um, to better understand which drugs work, which are safe, and which are effective. In addition, we're harnessing the, the global uh, coalition to develop and evaluate va uh, candidate vaccines and we launched last Friday the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator or the ACT Accelerator Accelerator, which is bringing together partners who are developing the vaccine, manufacturers, um, political leaders, uh, researchers, and, and communities to better accelerate uh, the development of these vaccines, make sure that the production is at scale, and that we have equitable access to this vaccine once a vaccine becomes available. And we're very grateful to all of our partners. Next slide, please. So what can you do uh, to help this? There's many things that you can do, just a few on this slide here. Um, you can help us to implement evidence-based recommendations and guidance. Make sure that these are agile and adaptive according to the, to the situation that you are in. It's important to know that transmission intensity will change, so you will need to implement them at a more aggressive manner in some states and then lift them and other, at other points in time. And that may fluctuate over as the, this pandemic evolves. Health systems need to be strengthened now. They must be strengthened now and they must be better as we build back better after this pandemic. Develop the workforce that's necessary to identify, isolate, test and treat all cases and trace and quarantine every contact. And we need to ensure that the health workforce is protected. Um, a whole of society and a whole of government approach must uh, remain um, and stay strong as we move through this. Uh, to ensure that the public health and social measures are in place and remain in place to reduce transmission. Um, and again, these may intensify and ease as the pandemic evolves. And it's really important that we document our lessons learned. We need to share the practices that work, the challenges that we face um, with us, but more importantly with others. We are constantly learning about this new virus, it's the first pandemic of a coronavirus, there's always something to learn and we always can be better. And it's important that you share those lessons learned and you document those so that we, we build back better uh, and that we can deal with the second and third waves of this pandemic as this pandemic evolves. Next, please. I think that's it. And just lastly, um, we have a, a number of uh, documents and resources on our website. I just list a few here, but please come back to this. Um, be well informed and stay informed with the latest information as this evolves. We have trainings online. We have an EpiWin platform, which is for information for networks, uh, information networks for epidemics. We have Mythbusters, which are trying to make ensure that people are finding accurate information. Um, and we try to tackle this infodemic as well as pandemic. Um, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Von Kerkhoff for your comments and for this overview. And it's clear that as you pointed out, no one solution will work for every country, but there are some common foundations that almost try to fulfill, such as protecting frontline health workers and also protecting the most vulnerable. I am pleased to now welcome Her Excellency, Ms. Petra Bayer, a member of the Austrian Parliament and a member of the IPU Advisory Group on Health. Ms. Bayer, what do you as a parliamentarian see as the key areas for parliamentary engagement in the COVID-19 response? 
Yeah, first, a very good afternoon from Vienna. I think that our, our duty as members of parliament is first and foremost to secure parliamentarism, parliamentary democracy, because we know that there are some governments who want to misuse the situation and to push back parliaments and rule by decree without parliamentary involvement and oversight. So I, I think it's really very important that we keep parliamentarism alive. And of course, there are different ways how to tackle this problem because we have different constitutions and different laws that deal with our, our model of, of parliamentarism. On the one hand, I can tell you about Austria. We still meet physically, um, but we try to keep distance. That means in our plenary hall, every second seat stays free. But we also use the balcony for MPs. We also use other empty rooms in the, in the building where we broadcast the debates. And we um, have the, the decisions taken always at the very end of block about all the laws discussed over the whole day um, that we do not spend too much time together in a very close setting. But for instance, I know from a colleague from Malaysia that they started with online parliamentary plenary sessions maybe six weeks ago already. Um, they use a, a specific um, a video tool, I don't know the name, but they can take decisions, they can uh, raise topics, they can speak and the whole a uh, parliamentary plenary session is also broadcasted in TV so that people can follow as they usually also could follow if it would happen um, in the parliamentary building. But um, to tell you another, a third example, I'm also a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where 48 different European countries come together to one plenary room. And of course, because of travel restrictions, different travel, tra travel restrictions in the different countries, it's much more difficult how to handle this situation. And for instance, we will have a, a meeting of the Bureau of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe this Thursday, where we will decide about how the committees are going to work in the next few weeks and what decisions can, take, can be taken um, via video conferences and for what decisions we have to seek written consultation because not every, every decision is, is same important. And so for some decisions, we will um, work with written decisions. But uh, for instance, we will have scheduled a plenary session end of July. And at the moment, nobody knows how we will handle that plenary session at all. So we will also debate about that. Um, later this week, and uh, it's quite unlikely that we will meet in Strasbourg end of this month. So, but now to come to the content as well, because I think it's not only the form and the way how we meet, it's also what we should put in, in, in center of our political decisions. So first of, co of course, it's health. And there I think that access to free basic health services is totally essential and this is a public good. And I really want to underline that it is not a good idea to have health systems, to have hospitals, to have clinics privatized. It's, um, it's the health of the people which should be in the center and not the profit of, of some enterprises. And we ourselves in, in Austria, we were accused by some economists and even our court of audit that we have much too far um, uh, beds in hospital for intensive care. It's a, it's a share of the population, which is a quite good one. And now everybody is very happy that we have this good share. And even the, the court um, um, of auditors said, okay, we take back this uh, recommendations. It's fine, keep it as it is, because you see that in emergencies, it's better to spend, to have, to have beds for intensive care, maybe be free and be not, not occupied for many months, but in cases like this, when you need it, you have it, and that's good. And also to, to stay at health, I think it's really important, especially for women, um, to keep uh, a safe access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. For instance, to really guarantee access to contraceptives and access to family planning methods, which is often under stress in situations like that, as, as we see. 
but we know that the pandemic is not only a health issue it's also has of course social effects and let me just mention a few um, of course it's the the, the question of, of working possibilities um, it's so crucial to avoid unemployment um, in austria for instance we have on the one hand the the way we took is to have short time work uh, in the formal sector uh, and to mention it we are only eight million inhabitants in austria and uh, about um, one billion now is working short time part time only and that's subsidized by by the government um, that people do not lose their jobs totally but we also have more than 600,000 unemployed people now which of course is a disaster and I think that in countries where you have a much more informal sector as we have in Austria for instance it's really very key to keep a balance between restrictions of movement and the, possi the, the working poss possibilities and opportunities um, for people as we know, if they do not have the chance to work and earn money, they will starve. And, and uh, that also cannot be a solution not to die by the, from the virus, but from starvation. Um, I also would like to line out children, as they are especially targeted, because they often do not get that medical care that they would need. Um, we know that when families fall short in their income, it's very likely the children who suffer from malnutrition. Um, and not to forget the problem of education um, in, in countries uh, where you have a well-equipped um, internet sector, it might be technically easy to have homeschooling, to provide distance learning, but nevertheless, it's mostly the women who are tied to, to the house then to, to take care of the children. And in countries where you do not have this ICT equipment, um, it's very hard how to reach these children. I know from a colleague from Kenya, for instance, that they really struggle and now try to bring up a radio program, teaching radio programs, because they know with radio, it's much likely that you really can reach many people. I think all these examples show that it's very crucial to have lively parliamentarism, uh, that you as parliaments have to be able to act in what way ever, what solution ever you find. It might differ a lot, of course, um, due to different circumstances, but it's important to take decisions by parliamentarians, which are for the benefit of the people. And let me end with a very first, with a very last thought. Um, we now some countries also subsidize now uh, research for vaccination, for medicine against the virus. And pharmaceutical industry is, is searching. And I'm convinced that it's, it's a question of moral and of humanity that when a, a vaccination successfully will be equipped and it is subsidized by public money, it, it should be clear that it is open for everybody without paying, without any fees, um, as it's really important um, to make that um, improvement reachable for everybody and that everybody really can secure him or herself from the virus in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, I would like to let everyone know that we have over 460 parliamentarians online listening and they have sent in quite a few questions. Unfortunately, our time is quite limited. So I will really only be able to put a few questions uh, to our experts from WHO uh, before the end of the webinar. And I'd like to start with a question that has come um, from colleagues working in the area of uh, the Middle East and Jordan. And the question is, what needs to be done to ensure that one of the most vulnerable population groups, refugees, get better access to treatment and to prevention as well? What, do you, what does WHO recommend as measures that can be taken to protect refugees? I, uh, thank you for that question. And I can see where our colleagues in the Middle East might, might ask if the, the Middle East is suffering one of the largest multi-country humanitarian crises in history. Um, I've spent uh, a lot of my previous years in the Middle East and worked in, in Syria, in Jordan, uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and Lebanon and many other places. So I know the context very well. Um, I think our greatest fear 
in this one of our greatest fears in this pandemic is that this disease will reach uh, into uh, refugee populations, particular displaced populations living in overcrowded conditions. We've already seen how quickly this virus can spread, for example, on cruise ships. We've seen in migrants dormitories in Singapore how quickly the disease can spread. The impact of the disease then is very much dependent on the vulnerability of the population in those closed conditions. When the virus enters a long-term care facility, it causes devastation. But when the virus goes on to a military ship, it may cause infection, but there are very few serious cases. So the, the impact in the, in the community, uh, the spread of the disease is determined by the overcrowding and the sanitation and the hygiene. The impact is very often de determined by the age profile and the underlying vulnerabilities of those populations. And you would have to argue that in stressed refugee populations already suffering from other health conditions, in closed, uh, packed environments, and without access to adequate health services, that the impact of this disease in those settings could be huge, uh, and will be huge in, in many cases. That's why we've, the Director General, Dr. Tedros, um, launched with Mark Lowcock and the Secretary General a number of weeks ago a special humanitarian appeal to address the issues in fragile and conflict-affected situations and specifically identifying budget lines and projects that will be specifically aimed at those humanitarian populations. Our other Assistant Director General uh, on Emergency Response, Dr. Ibrahima Sosef Fal, co-chairs the IASC Working Group with Mark Loka, which is specifically has all the principals in the UN system working together on um, with the likes of uh, the head of UNHCR, the head of IOM, and others, uh, looking at how we can increase resilience in these settings. There's a number of things we can do. One is we can reduce the chance that the disease reaches these populations, and that, to an extent, is a matter of shielding those populations from disease coming in um, and reducing the risk of sick people, even, even aid workers going into a camp situation can bring the disease with them. So we need to ensure that aid workers and others going into camp situations and are themselves healthy. Uh, number two, we can reduce the risk of disease spreading in these situations by the simplest means of hygiene, provision of clean water, provision of hand washing facilities. It is very difficult for people to social distance or physical distance in those environments, very, very difficult indeed. But there are other measures. And for example, we've been working with, with the, those agencies mm -hmm. on adaptive measures, like potentially even mask wearing, which is not recommended in the general population, but in the specific population and camps, may be a useful additional measure. The third part is really, and, and some of these camps and, and these overcrowded situations, the reality is these people have been living in overcrowded situations before the pandemic. Uh, should they continue to live in these overcrowded conditions? It's a risk to them and it's a risk to everybody else. So we also have to look at the appropriate design and implementation of these uh, camp situations and provide adequate space. We also then need, if there is our cases, to have adequate treatment. We are very concerned about places like Haiti. We're very concerned about places like Yemen, Syria, uh, Somalia. Uh, we've seen uh, a rapid increase in cases in Sudan, in South Sudan, in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti and other places. And while the numbers are relatively low, the direction and the is upwards and, in, and going in a worrying direction. So we have much to do, and we would like to recognize our partners, both in the UN system and the NGO partners who we work with. There's a huge amount of work going on, both to prevent and, uh, and suppress and mitigate the impacts of these populations. Now, these populations will pay a heavy price if we don't act now to protect them. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. We have come to the end of the webinar, and obviously we have not been able to go through all the questions. However, IPU, UNDRR, and working with WHO, will go through the questions and we will find a way to come back to you with the answers. There were many good questions, including what needs to be done to ensure that such a pandemic never occurs again. Before we adjourn, I would like to go back to the respective heads of the IPU, UNDRR, and WHO to provide one minute of a final reflection. And I would like to start with Mr. Chungong, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? 
Yes, please, go ahead, one minute, okay. please. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Loretta. I, I found this uh, discussion very refreshing. And uh, uh, as we said at the beginning, this is not the end of it all. I think there is a uh, need for an ongoing conversation between the uh, scientific community, the specialized community, and the community of uh, policy makers, if we are to conquer the current uh, pandemic and make sure that things don't happen the way they're happening today. I think that's just one of the things that I take away from this uh, meeting. And the other thing is that uh, when we are talking about uh, the crisis, we are talking about human beings. We're not talking about politics. We're not talking about others. We're not talking about democracy in the abstract. We are talking of human lives. And human lives should be apolitical. And so we uh, welcome the uh, approach uh, that there should be an all of government uh, uh, approach addressing uh, the issue of uh, uh, COVID-19. And there, when we talk of all of government, we're not talking of only the executive arm of government, we're also talking about the legislative arm of government. The other thing I take away is that action should be taken now. We, we, we cannot afford to wait. We're dealing with an emergency. But we should also use the situation as a lesson to build better, to build more resilient societies that can cope with such crises in, in the future. Uh, I was, while we, uh, we were making our comments, I saw lots of questions coming in. And lots of those questions had to do with the role of parliaments, what parliaments are doing. I would like to refer those who were asking those questions to the IPU website, where we have an inventory of what uh, uh, several parliaments, calls of parliaments are doing to respond to the crisis. Looking at emergency uh, legislation that is being put in place, the uh, emergency resources that parliaments are authorizing for uh, government to respond to the crisis. We even have examples where some parliaments are actually contributing to the uh, WHO Solidarity Fund that has been created. So that there's a lot of good practice out there and I would encourage uh, the, um, uh, the participants to refer to the IPU website for examples of good practice that they can emulate in their own in their own countries. Of course, we stand ready to work with WHO and UNDRR to respond to all those questions that have come in because we think we are duty bound to clarify any doubts in the minds of the people out there. So I thank you very much, and I I look forward to uh, this uh, discussion going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shingong, and I would now like to ask Ms. Nami Mitsutori for her reflections. Thank you very much, Laurie. Uh, so I believe that um, there are three fundamentally important things in order to manage any disaster risk, including the one that we are facing. One, to understand what is the risk we are facing. And for this, the role of science is very important. Second, we need to enhance the government of risk management. And here, I repeat that countries have to have both local national disaster risk reduction strategies, which are importantly backed by laws and regulations. And the third is we need to invest in prevention. In this case, the public health service. We have seen that countries who were better in this have been able to respond better. And all three aspects are really very much related to the role of parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Torrey. And finally, Dr. Tedros, I know you have to leave, but could you please give us your final message to the parliamentarians today? Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. That was an excellent uh, mod mo mo moderation. <laughs> excellent moderator. Um, my um, one minute intervention is I will not say anything different from what I said earlier and I have said many times uh, in the past uh, few weeks or a couple of months. We must be united in our resolve to prepare for, respond to, and mitigate the effects of health emergencies on communities, societies, and economies. Let me repeat once again, the foundation of global solidarity is national unity. National unity and global solidarity, that's how we will defeat this pandemic. And the, the good thing is bringing national unity is the responsibility of MPs from across political lines to unite and work together. 
when there is a crack between us, between different political parties, that's where the virus actually uh, exploits. So let's not allow the virus to exploit our differences at the national level. I'll give you one example. I had um, a meeting, I had a, a phone call conversation with the Prime Minister of uh, Finland. Uh, she's really great. And we were discussing about um, unity at the national level. And she told me that they have a committee, joint committee of all political parties to work together. And that's what we need in each and every country. We don't need to use this virus to score political punches against each other. This is fire. This is devil. And I think our MPs, you are the ones who can bring all aisles, both aisles when you have two or many political parties in many countries working together to defeat this virus at national level. That strong national unity will bring strong global solidarity. And we should tell countries to work together. Many superpowers are not working together. There was cooperation even during the Cold War. And I gave an example, if you remember, some time ago, when former USSR and United States joined forces to defeat smallpox, to eradicate smallpox, because it was a killer at that time. Why can't we do the same thing now? What is dividing us at the global level and at the national level? I leave it up to you, our MPs, to make something to bring everybody together, have national unity, and defeat this virus as soon as possible. You have the biggest weapon ever, that's to bring unity. And I count on you. I count on you. And I feel nostalgic, actually, when I was thinking about joining you today, because I was an MP myself, and I feel the nostalgia even now as a member of parliament. And I'm also happy that I joined because I know, I know you have the means to make unity happen that can help us to defeat this virus. So thank you once more. Very honored to join you and look forward to uh, continue our partnership. We have already committed to the world to make sure that Health for All happens, UHC happens in Serbia. And that's, by the way, the strategic solution to reduce or minimize vulnerability to pandemics like this. So let's also focus on the strategic investment, on the strategic solution. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, all organizers. organizers. Thank you, Mami. Uh, thank you, all participants. And look forward to having you in person when this thing is behind, behind us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tedros, for ending today's webinar with this call for national unity and global solidarity. I'd like to thank all of our distinguished panelists and thank you also to all of the hundreds of parliamentarians who joined us today from around the world. We hope that you found the advice and information useful and it will help you in your fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. This webinar is now concluded. Stay safe and goodbye.